Hey there, this is Professor John Gallagher, and I'm so glad you've decided to learn to build apps. Congratulations! I've spent several years teaching iOS development to hundreds of students in person and many more online. Now, those courses were in Swift with Apple's older technology, UIKit, but this is my first course in Apple's newer technology, Swift UI. Now, this is the same material I use in my university course for undergraduates. That course is open to all students and doesn't assume any prior coding experience. And while we'll eventually move quickly, we'll first build a solid base, and I'll always try to bring high energy and enthusiasm. So let's learn big. Now let's start with some inspiration that you can find in the YouTube video linked in the lesson's description. Drew Houston, who developed Dropbox when he was in his 20s, has said that coding is the closest thing that we have to a real superpower. And this is a wonderful way to think about coding. It allows you to take your vision, turn it into something creative, hopefully something that makes you happy and that can help other people. And hopefully you find that there is a really lucrative and fun career in this as well. So let's start helping you acquire that superpower so you can become a coding hero. Now before we dive into programming in Swift and learning to build apps, we've got to make sure that you've got a few things. First up is an Apple developer account. So pull up your browser and go to developer.apple.com. Now you'll probably see a screen that looks a little bit different than this. Apple is constantly updating this with new resources and new information. Now there's good news. The base Apple developer account is free. And there's more good news if you've been using an iOS device. If you've ever bought anything over iTunes or in the App Store, used iCloud or Apple Pay, then you've already got an Apple ID. So what we're going to do is simply link that Apple ID to your new Apple developer account. So click the account link at the top of this page. And if you don't have an Apple ID, just go down here to where it says create yours now. Otherwise, just log in with the email address that's associated with your Apple ID and use that Apple ID's password. You might be asked to approve your login through two-factor authentication, and you'll also be asked to approve any terms of service associated with your Apple developer account. Now, you might also see invitations to join Apple's developer program, but know that setting up an Apple developer account is free. That's all you need to start learning how to build apps using Apple's free Xcode software. You do not need a paid Apple developer account. Now, when you are ready to submit apps to the App Store, then you'll need a paid account, and that's usually $99 a year for US developers. Now, even with the free account, you're going to be able to install apps directly on any device that's connected to your Mac. But as of this recording, if you have the free account, those apps expire in a week and need to be reinstalled. This isn't a big deal when you're learning, but if you give your apps to friends and family, know that they will need a reinstall in a week until you're a developer program member. Now, some more good news. If you're taking this course as part of an educational institution, or if you're part of a nonprofit organization or an approved government entity in certain countries, there are ways to waive that $99 fee to avoid the seven-day timeout. Now, you can search online for more information about this, and if you're taking this course as part of a university or school program, your instructor may have some more details. Now, for those of you that do create apps and submit them to the App Store, please let me know. I love trying out apps from former students and sharing the success of students who have learned from my content. It's super rewarding to hear from you, so please stay in touch. Now, let's talk the software that we need to build apps. The software we're going to be using to build apps is called Xcode. It's Apple's professional development software. It's free, and it's the same stuff that all of the developers at Apple use when they write your iOS, iPad, Watch, TV, and Mac software. Xcode is an IDE or integrated development environment. And in the way that you use Excel to create spreadsheets or Word to create documents, you use an IDE like Xcode to create programs like apps. Now, IDEs don't only allow you to edit programs, but they typically have debugging tools. Xcode will also simulate iOS devices on your Mac so that you don't need to install code on a device to test it. Google has something called Android Studio. Microsoft has Visual Studio. There are lots of other IDEs available for particular development environments, but Xcode is definitely the best choice for building products that run on Apple platforms. Now, before installing Xcode, I strongly recommend that you upgrade to the latest release version of Mac OS, not the beta version. Xcode might even require the latest version of Mac OS to run. Now, a quick heads up. This is the version of Xcode that I've used to record our initial videos. As of this recording, this version is in beta. It's not in final release. Most of the time, you want to use release version of Xcode, not beta, because beta is pre-release, and it usually contains bugs. But I'm using the beta here because this version has newer changes to Swift UI and Xcode that are so important that I don't want my students using the older version. Now, before you download Xcode, first check the App Store. If the version in the App Store, the non-beta version, is at or above this version, then download the App Store version. But if the App Store version is a number smaller than this one, and that's what I'm showing here, then download the beta version from Apple's developer website. Now you're going to build apps and test them using an iPhone simulator in Xcode, which runs on your Mac. So you need a Mac to build apps, but you don't even need an iPhone or an iPad. Now, if you're working with beta features that aren't in the current version of iOS, I usually tell fall students to just work in their Mac simulator until the latest version of iOS comes out, usually in September. Then you can install your apps after that new version of iOS comes out. This way you don't have to put any buggy beta operating system software on your phone. It's not an issue for spring students since everything's out of beta by then. 
Now do know that Xcode can take a long time to install and require a large amount of disk space. Apple's getting better at decreasing the size of Xcode, but to give you an idea, some of my students reported that the prior version of Xcode could take as long as an hour to download and completely install, and even though the App Store said that it only took up 12 gigs of disk space, the actual disk space required to do the install was about twice that, since there were a lot of temporary files that were downloaded and decompressed and used as part of the installation. So if you're tight on disk space, be prepared to move personal files off to the cloud before you install or buy an external hard drive. If you're waiting for a long download or installation, feel free to forward this video toward the end where you can watch the keys to success. Now, if you were able to download the version of Xcode you need from the App Store, once the download is done, you can quit the App Store app. Xcode is automatically placed in your Applications folder. You can drag it into the dock if you want, then launch Xcode and approve any additional downloads, folder access, accept any terms of service, and you won't need to install the Watch or TV OS components at this stage in your learning journey. That'll also save you some disk space. Now, if you downloaded the beta version of Xcode, there are a few additional steps to set up. A file with the .xip extension is saved to your Mac. It's likely in the Downloads folder. When that's downloaded, open that file and you'll see a dialog that says it's expanding the file. Again, this may take quite a few minutes. And then when Xcode-beta appears, that's your Xcode application. So you can drag that into your Applications folder and you can now safely throw away the .xip file. You won't need that again. And you can also drag Xcode-beta into the dock if you'd like. Again, that very first time you launch Xcode, it'll take a long time to start up. You might even think it's hanging, but be prepared to let it work and come back to it later. It shouldn't take more than an hour, but it could take quite a bit of time. And since we just installed Xcode, we're not even going to create a project yet. We're going to add our Apple ID and our GitHub ID. Now to do that, head up to the Xcode menu and select Preferences. And from the dialog that shows up, click the Accounts tab, and then click the plus icon in the lower left corner. Select Apple ID from the list, Click the Continue button, and then enter the email associated with your Apple ID that's the same one that you just used to link to an Apple developer account. Select Next, enter your Apple ID password, press Return or select Next, and there's a chance the first time that you do this you'll be asked to approve some things from a security standpoint, just to prove anything that you're asked to, and now your Apple ID is your developer ID in Xcode. Now my setup might look a little different than yours because I do have a paid Apple developer program account, but you should be good, so now let's set up your GitHub account. Now if you're new to software development, you probably don't have a GitHub account, so open your browser and head to github.com and click on sign up for GitHub and get your new account. That's also free. Now, GitHub is one of the most important sites in the lives of software developers. Microsoft actually bought this company for several billion dollars a few years back, and GitHub is a few things. First, it's the largest online software repository in the world. Think of it as a big library. It's a great place to go and look for code examples, some projects that you want to learn from, or projects that you want to build off of or contribute to. Now, GitHub is also a tool for version control. In this way, you can consider GitHub as a place where you can back up versions of your projects to the cloud for safekeeping. So in case anything happens to your code and you want to go back to an earlier version and use that, or if you want to build off of an earlier version of code without interrupting the original copy, you can do all of that by using GitHub. Now, GitHub is also a great tool for team collaboration so several people can work on the same project at the same time. And your instructor might even set up a classroom GitHub account so that you can submit projects and assignments for class. Now, GitHub is also a place where you can post your software development portfolio online for others to see. And most employers that are hiring software developers today look at the public accounts of potential employees to get a sense of what kind of projects someone has worked on, their learning progression as a software developer. And because of that, you probably want to add your GitHub account to your LinkedIn profile too. And now that you have a GitHub account, head back to the Xcode Accounts tab in the Preferences box, and down near the lower left corner, click on the plus icon to add another account. This time, find and select GitHub, not GitHub Enterprise or any the other GitHub options, just plain GitHub. Click Continue, and under Account, enter your GitHub user ID. And you'll see you're being asked for a token. Now, GitHub has switched to using tokens instead of straight passwords for its security authentication. And you get a token by returning to GitHub after you've logged in. So here I am in my browser. I'm already logged into GitHub. And then head to the upper right-hand corner where this circle represents your account. Now, pull down this menu and select Settings. And then scroll down, and on the left-hand side, look for Developer Settings. Click that. Then on the left-hand side again, you'll see Personal Access Tokens, click that. And then on the right, you'll see Generate New Token. Click that button, and then under Note, give the token a name. Xcode would be a good name since this token's going to be used in Xcode. 
Now under this is a pull down menu to set your tokens expiration. And when you're working in industry, you'll always use expiring tokens. But for my personal use, since I've got pretty good password hygiene, I keep different passwords. I also use a password manager and you absolutely should too. So make a note to yourself to download and use a password manager if you're not already using one. For all these reasons, and because I'm a business of just one, I'm gonna make it easy on myself and choose no expiration. Even though the security gurus at GitHub don't recommend this. And then underneath this, select the scope of access or how much access the user of this token gets. Now, frankly, by clicking on repo here, that should be enough for you. But since I use GitHub pretty extensively via Xcode, I'm gonna select everything. Now you'd wanna be a bit more conservative with security if you were worried about someone else having access to your Mac and your employer will likely have far tighter security. If you're curious about how scope works, you can click on read more about OAuth scopes for more documentation, but selecting everything is gonna be fine for me since I'm a company of one and my computer is very secure. And so with everything selected, I'm just gonna click on this green generate token button and this very long alphanumeric value that's generated is the token that we need to paste into Xcode. So you can either click on the clipboard icon or highlight the value and copy it, then return to Xcode, paste this value into Xcode in the token field, then click the sign in button and congratulations, you've just set up Xcode to work with GitHub. And with our setup done, you can quit out of Xcode and close your browser. Now also, before we get into building apps, I wanna share some keys to success that I've learned from my hundreds of students over several years of teaching app development. And the first is code often. Learning to program is like learning a foreign language, and the more that you speak a new language, the better you're gonna get. Same thing with programming. Now I've deliberately created the videos in this course to be a half hour in length or less. And hopefully this makes it easier for you to complete a video or two every day. And if you do that, you'll really see yourself progress and you'll have fewer big gaps in time where you don't code and where you might forget what you've already learned. Now students who put off their work until the day before assignments are due almost always struggle. So do a little bit of work every day. You'll find that you retain more of your knowledge. You'll see yourself improve and your learning process will be less frustrating. Now this series is definitely meant to be learning by doing. So you're gonna to wanna to have a browser open while you're watching videos and also have Xcode open. And you'll wanna pause the videos, then tab over to Xcode, complete the steps and build apps along the way. Now you'll also find that it can be very useful after you've completed the video and gone through all the steps to open up a new project or playground and try to repeat those steps without the use of the video or reference materials. This is a great way to make sure that you're really retaining knowledge. And if you struggle with anything, you can go back and rewatch the video, try again. Also make sure you try the challenges mentioned in the video lessons. And if you can't get a challenge the first time, cut along with a the solution, then try again later until you got the technique down cold. Also remember that I've got a Google Drive on my website that includes all of the keynote slides that I present to my students with their challenge exercises and the solutions. These are the same ones that I use with my students and I release material each week after every week's class. Now also experiment with new projects and playgrounds. If you've learned techniques, you can always open a new project or a new playground to see if you can apply what you've just learned in a different context. Programming should be wildly fun, and it's especially enjoyable when you start to build your own stuff. Even if it's just small parts of an app or experiments with a technique that you've learning inside of a playground. So if you're wondering, hey, I wonder what would happen if I do this, or if I make a change to the technique that I just learned. Well, just give it a try as those questions arise. You can do it as part of a new project or playground so that you don't mess up your existing work. And this is a great way to strengthen your skills as a software developer. Now also remember, if you ever get stuck, there are a ton of additional resources available to help you out. And another thing you should know about if you're new to coding, do know that there's a site online that's a friend to all software developers that's called Stack Overflow. Now Stack Overflow is the most popular question and answer site for programmers. And if you search this site, you'll almost always find that somebody else has encountered the same problem that you have, and you're likely to find a fast answer. So I definitely recommend that you visit Stack Overflow and create your own account. Also, as you learn more, you're gonna be able to answer other people's questions too. And you'll get reputation points points for doing so, and something that's important to be aware of, employers pay attention to your Stack Overflow behavior. So if you learn and help other people, that's a great indication that you'll be a good team member too. And the opposite is also true. So for anybody that's snarky or mean to other people online, that's the kiss of death when it comes to getting hired. So make sure that you've got good online etiquette. Now GitHub can also be an amazing learning resource. There are lots of coding examples online. YouTube and blogs can also be great resources for learning more. And as you go through this material, you're gonna be more comfortable looking things up online and learning on your own. And that's a vital skill for anybody working in tech. 
Now, Apple's also got some wonderful resources online as well. You can explore Apple's resources and find coding examples. There's guidance on user interface design. And also, every year in June, Apple runs a huge event that they call the Worldwide Developer Conference, or WWDC. Now, Apple will post all of the learning videos and workshops from these events online. In fact, many of my former students have gone to work for Apple, and it's always great to see a former student presenting their work for Apple at the WWDC. So check those videos out. They're a great way to learn advanced techniques and to keep up to date with new innovations coming from Apple. Also, if you're a student, every year Apple offers scholarships for the WWDC, so keep your eye out for those every spring and consider applying for those as well. And finally, I really want to hear from you. Creating content and releasing videos for free on YouTube is definitely a lonely endeavor. So I really love hearing from people that are using this work, who are learning from these videos and having fun. So whether you're an instructor, a classroom student, or an independent learner, please take time to drop a comment below the YouTube videos. And also do know that if you like or subscribe, that's also used by YouTube and their search algorithms to surface these videos. And that can be tremendously helpful to me as I try to reach even more students. So if you take a small amount of time to do that, you've got my sincere thanks. Also, if you're an educator, do share this material with other colleagues. It's great to get the word out there. And as an added bonus, if you take a photo or a screenshot of what you're doing based on what you've learned in my videos, and you post it to Twitter with the hashtag BuiltWithProfG, I have my teaching assistants go through all of the posts on those hashtags every week or so, and they select one of those posts to receive one of the much coveted My Mac Builds Apps laptop stickers. So share your work under the hashtag and you might win one too. Now, also, if you're curious, I've got lots of other course content online as well. I also teach a course in physical computing using CircuitPython. So, for example, you'll see maker and engineering content videos on things like how to build a robot that you can control from an iOS app, or as a way to use an iOS app with a Raspberry Pi to get it to play sounds remotely, a sort of online ventriloquism. Always fun. Seeking Professor G, you are. Come to the right place you have. So if you subscribe and revisit the channel, hopefully you'll find some other things beyond this course that you like as well. And if you follow on Twitter or Instagram, I often share announcements of related materials on there too. So I'm really looking forward to celebrating your success. Thanks so much for letting me be part of your coding journey. I hope you have a lot of fun at this. Best of luck. Now it's time for big learning. Giddy up.